Hey, fanboy nation. This is your pal Daffy Duck, and you're watching. You're watching. We're watching. You're watching. Fanboy. 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 A fanboy, etc. Fanboy nation. Dot. I assume. No. Um. <laughs> Neil McGregor, we are talking to you today about Hinkley. Your documentary is absolutely fantastic. As an Aussie that traded gold for aluminum when you came to Canada, I do have to ask you, what was your interest in telling this story about the American president getting shot in 1981 by somebody that was infatuated with Jodie Foster? Uh, well, Robert, thank you very much for, uh, for taking the time to chat. It's, uh, it's a pleasure. Certainly... A story that, like all good stories, you never go out and find the ones you seek, but it's the ones that sort of find you at a left field. Uh, this one came about purely just by by chance. I was looking for some music for another project in post production for, and I heard a John Hinckley YouTube algorithm that went on its little uh, adventure, and I was like, that's actually quite a good cover. Uh, and I saw the name John Hinckley, I was like, why do I know that? I googled it, and sure enough, there is the uh, the man that battled mental health and the taxi driver obsession that went and shot uh, President Reagan and, and three other people in 1981, trying to uh, make it in, in life as a, as a musician and artist. And that's a story that has to be told. So I just was couldn't get out of my head of how does someone go from that to trying to uh, move on with their life in that way. Just such a fascinating story. The fact that and it's no secret that he was released unconditionally. He wasn't released into any sort of guardianship. He didn't have anyone that had to oversee him. There was no weekly check-in with, with the psychologist anymore. It's just, here you go, 40 years, and go back to regular society. Um, when you get to interview John and then follow him around for all this time, what is it like seeing a man that spent 40 years in a mental institution now be released into everyday society without a transitional period? It's like, you've been locked up. Here you go. Go ahead. Have at it. Yeah, look, it's certainly, uh, I think when I first was, was chatting with him, it was for my own safety. And, and you know, obviously, it's, it's hard not to have that unconscious bias talking to him. He did have, uh, from sort of the early, mid-90s, through to when he was released in 2022, he did have day releases and a soft kind of re-entrance day releases and such like that. Uh, so he, he was able to have a little bit more of a transition. It wasn't like uh, that guy in Shawshank Redemption who's locked up for 40 years and, and here you go, good luck. Uh, so his, his mental health things was obviously very severe. Uh, he'd gone through a lot of music and art therapy, was able to overcome all those sorts of things. And he's just a normal person, uh, you know, got a bit of a, a sense of humour, is quite a, a normal kind of person having conversation. Uh, so, yeah, felt very comfortable spending time with him. Uh, you know, my wife who's a producer and has a criminology uh, forensic mental health uh, master's. And, yeah, we did all our sort of uh, safeguard barriers, uh, making sure that he felt comfortable too. And yeah, we followed him around and he led us into obviously what he's doing now, but also, uh, you know, earned that sort of rapport and trust. And he opened up his uh, Pandora's box of all of his life from everything from the late seventies through to uh, yeah, the taxi driver and the Jodie Foster and the assassination attempt. Uh, so it was quite an interesting experience, especially as an Australian, as an outsider sharing the story, what I think that allowed is that lens was a unique one. It allowed me to be objective rather than subjective. Uh, I wasn't around in 1981 when that event happened. Uh, it was 1985. So it just allowed me to sort of see John as he is rather than, uh, you know, what unconscious bias of people might think of him. Um, but also in saying that, can't excuse the very violent acts of things that he's done in the past either. Right. And have you heard from, say, the Reagan family? I know Ron Reagan wasn't very close with his dad, but there's still this weird, you know, someone tried to assassinate his father. Does Jodie Foster still have, like, a restraining order against him at this point, even though it's 40 years later? Like, 
how does that work out for you know the victims themselves whether it was psychological on, on foster's part or actually having your father be nearly assassinated on the reagan family part yeah that's, that's a great question uh, robert and also there was three other people james brady who was impaired his entire life uh you know his death was ruled a homicide from the actions of John and uh, two police officers and Secret Service also injured too, you know, and their families. So this film does tie up a lot of uncomfortable truths. Uh, with Jodie Foster, she obviously distanced herself and understandably so. As as you rightly said, Robert, she, she was not a physically hurt victim, but still heavily traumatised. Uh, and uh, obviously former President uh, Reagan did forgive John uh, for that. Uh, the Reagan Library were actually very, very supportive of the project. They allowed access to a lot of images and uh, audio recordings and video and things that hadn't been seen before that are in this documentary. Uh, you know, what's really, really unique is that the, the timeliness of this and the story of it is, is very important. The event of the taxi driver and, and uh, the assassination attempt is what John Hinckley is most well known for, but it's that's only just part of what his entire interesting life is. Uh, so it was really, really uh, great that John allowed himself to be vulnerable to talk through all those. And he definitely has that uh, remorse of him not being in a state of mental health at the time uh, that did these things, but we can't excuse those actions, uh, irregardless. The, you know, it's incredibly immense. I also sort of see that the entire nation of, of the US was impacted by these events and history has repeated itself more recently in, in a different way. So that trauma is still there and this film certainly does dig up some uncomfortable uh, things about the past that still are, are present in, in a few different ways beyond the actual events and the victims that have been traumatised by those actions in 1981. Right. Someone who's an absolute cynic would be like, wow, this is absolute perfect timing. You couldn't do a PR stunt like this with a month and a half after the previous attempted assassination of a former president who's currently a presidential candidate. But the human side is going, oh, my God, 40 years later, we're still going through this. It, it, it is. I mean, as you said, Robert, the, the timing is, is, from a marketing perspective, uh, it, it is, is phenomenal in its, in its own sort of way. Uh, it's still terrible events, no matter where you sit on the political divide of, of that. It's, but I think, and what this film also does, this documentary, is it it looks into the the fabric of the, the American dream, you know, in, in a similar kind of way that Taxi Driver and Robert De Niro's character sort of plays. When I was going through all this archival footage, there is this sort of moment where uh, President Jimmy Carter and... Uh, Ronald Reagan were debating for who's going to be the president at the time, this is in 1980. The things and the very challenges that faced society back then are uh, very much what I'm sure, um, you know, Harrison and Trump will be debating about in, in a little over a few weeks' time and exactly what um, Biden and Trump were chatting to about just a few weeks or a month or so early in that debate. And I, I think that's kind of what's really, really fascinating. And myself as an outsider is able to sort of hold that sort of lens up and look at these challenges and sort of see that, you know, John Hinckley kind of is this unique person that's really able to tell a lot of American society and, and how far things have come and some of the amazing things that have done, but also how many steps back that, things are still not solved, they're still not where they need to be. And I think that's also what makes America such a, um, an, an amazing place as, as, a, as a society. And I think John is a really unusual but unique and profound uh, person to, to really hold that mirror up. And the, the, the timing of that is, is quite important. Right. And with Hinckley having been recognized for what happened in 1981, and he clearly seems remorseful to this day that it still weighs on him, but to also shine that lens that nearly 45 years later, there's financial issues, there's gas price issues, there's foreign policy issues that still either haven't been resolved or have regressed to what the late 70s, early 80s looked like. And it's almost disheartening 
you know, especially in an election cycle to go, wow, we're doing this yet again. So it's fascinating how the only thing that really has see seemingly changed in the last 45 years is technology. Yeah, I mean, it certainly has progressed. And I think that's a more human condition of society at large. And America and Australia are also similarly wired in our DNA that we're not immune to all these sorts of things. Uh, that's just kind of the way things go sometimes. Technology is a interesting note to to because that's part of how John is able to have a following as a musician through technology and YouTube. Uh, he posts all his videos and such. You know, he has that sort of following. So that technology element is is quite critical as as a part of his story, but also how we today are all sharing and consuming media and news like for us we actually released on our own platform you know the digital economy is, is is changing we could easily have gone to a lot of other more known streaming services uh and had lots of interesting offers Plus, we wanted to have editorial control to share the story correctly um so it's not just a true crime documentary this documentary is is, is profound and it's so much more than that and the timeliness and the reverence and relevance is yeah very important to make sure that that's a story that's watched now it, it's fascinating because you know this guy was in a mental institution for 40 plus years and now he's out 41 years after the assassination attempt and to sit there and go okay now he could be at a grocery store with us he could be at the shoe store with us and most people, because of the way he's aged or how unrecognizable he is in comparison with all the time has passed, wouldn't dawn on them that this was a guy that did something like that. But it's always in the back of John's mind. Um, when you get to see something like this and his personal interactions and in some strange way has a fan base as a musician, you know, how does that play into this and how does he rectify his notoriety, you know, of being who he is blended in with being a musician as well and trying to be recognized for that now? It, look, it's a certainly a very complex thing uh, for John. You know, he, as you said, he rightly, he walks amongst us. He's just a normal person. You probably might not even uh, recognize him if you passed him in the in the grocery store or you know walking down the street you know he does wrestle with the fact that his name somewhat defines him who he is that name is etched on the wrong side of history with you know Thomas Crooks, Lee Harvey Oswald, um, John Wilkes Booth he's in that infamy club uh, which is which is horrible that that's even something but to kind of cast that and try and move on, uh, obviously dropping the junior from his his name, you know, he does put it on his his guitar. It's interesting, that, and I know that's something that he struggles with because he's infamous because of the actions that he did, uh, you know, back in 1981, but he's also uh, certainly a very different person, you know, hearing audio tapes uh and interviews and things like that from him back then to him now it's he's a completely different person you know and that is that is obviously what mental health uh can do but for him to try and move on uh he's very aware that his uh name is entwined in that but it's hard to decouple his past from his present and i think that's what makes uh his story very much almost like a Greek Roman tragedy in a way because he's he's stuck in this purgatory. You can't it's very difficult to move on from from that past when you've done these these things that he's done. You know, it's fascinating that we're able to see a remorseful person, someone that's evolved from who he was 40 years ago, where it seems like social media won't let you escape your past. And here he is still trying to move on and move forward yet you're able to whittle this down to an hour and a half of tragedy, trauma, and in what he's seeking at this point, some sort of redemption. It, look, the first cut we did was about two and a half to three hours long. Uh, you know, his, 
past is is a Pandora's box of, of fascination. Uh, you know, from obviously the taxi driver thing, Jodie Foster uh, stalking. Uh, you know, his pen pals with Ted Bundy for a moment there. You know, he's obviously trying to be a musician. So there's a lot of complexities to really uh, pull out, uh, and there's a lot of things that we just couldn't go into the depth and detail because it is still a film documentary, and you've got to go through that sort of story and also give that justice. Not only for John, who's, you know, as a documentarian, you step into people's lives, you know, you, it's, it's a very, uh, you know, unique thing that you have and you've got to make sure that that's done justice. But also with this one, there's another layer where we have to be able to give justice to the people's lives who was impacted and affected. That's a very important part to it. Uh, so it was a very uh, uniquely challenging thing to be able to, to do that story right and as you said pulling it down to an hour and a half was certainly not easy we had an amazing uh production team here in uh in australia we worked with uh getty images and nbc and cbs all these uh archival uh places to find all this sort of stuff and, and craft that story and uh another interesting part of that was the courtroom sketches uh the artists have a uh kind of a clearance issue that like you can't actually use them beyond broadcast for news. And there's some amazing uh, courtroom sketches that didn't allow uh, the cameras in for the trial at the time. And that's sort of a common sort of thing that happens. So we had to recreate those uh, for the documentary just because we weren't allowed the clearances. So we actually reached out to a comic book artist here who's done stuff with Spider-Man and Star Wars and Batman and recreated those uh, courtroom sketches uh, in that 1980s style and more hand-drawn as it would have been done, recreating them. Uh, so there's a lot of unique approaches that you don't always know until you go into the story. There's the story you set out to do in film. Filming changes and evolves and new thing came out and this John opened up to a lot of things that made our edit, you know, profoundly complex and there's so many things that we could have, could, this could have been like an eight-part series. Uh, and then in the edit, we made sure that the audience was able to go on that sort of journey. I mean, where else and what opportunity you have to really put the audience into the shoes and the mind of someone that's done these sorts of things? That is, that is, I think, profoundly unique. Yeah, I'm going to leave you with this because we're running out of time, unfortunately, Neil, and I can talk to you about this all day. <laughs> well, but it's an Australian that did this and not an American with the U.S. bias. Um, you know, in releasing it on your own platform, how freeing is that? Along with where we'll be able to to purchase it. I know the pre-order is the 27th, but the full release, remind us of that release date. And after you interacting with John, you know, for all the time that you did, what do you think outside his legacy of, be, you know, attempting to assassinate the pre president for his love of Jodie Foster, uh, would he want his legacy to be from here on out in his redemption arc, shall we say? Yeah, I mean, that's a fantastic question. Look, the, 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 on the surface level, the story of this documentary is, you know, uh, a guy that's done a horrible event uh, in, a, in an unwell state of mind at the time and trying to move on with his life. And that redemption arc is his character. Underneath that, in the subtext of, of what this film that it is about that broken state of the American dream. It, it is really that anyone can accomplish the best of their abilities regardless of what they have. And I think that is the subtext of what this film is. And I think that's a very uh, important thing uniquely entwined to uh, uh, to someone like John, perhaps very unexpected. But now more than ever, that message is really, really important to, to look and understand. So the legacy that, that John hopes that he could move on with is that he is someone who has overcame uh, his mental health battles and he has genuine remorse for the lives and, and people that he impacted by those events that he did. Certainly can't excuse it and we certainly can't create empathy for those, uh, you know, and to move on with their life to try and uh, redeem is... A difficult thing to do, I don't think, and he knows that he probably can't decouple from those, uh, but he's certainly doing the best he can 
to move on, I think there's something, uh, I wouldn't say inspirational, but certainly something that's of note that, you know, no matter how we all make mistakes, perhaps not as big as the ones that, that John has done, but you can always change, evolve, and the betterment of, of self-betterment, but also for anyone else that's in a, a position to be able to better themselves or come back from a very uh, mistake that they've done. So I think that's something as a nice little legacy that John would hope and earning his freedom back is, I think, an important part of his, his story in that arc, perhaps more than the redemption itself. The platform itself is incredibly freeing. We had a, you know, we were looking at a lot of the usual uh, streaming services and the streaming industry is obviously changing in itself. And what we found was they wanted to have editorial control and make it just a true crime documentary without any of the present stuff. And we saw that and we certainly could tell that story. And there's obviously a lot of that part of it in there. But as we kind of got into it, there were there was something more profound, I think, uh, more important here than just that. So to release on our own platform, a bit of a sort of a tech kind of person, the digital economy is growing. People are watching and consuming, uh, you know, things that they want to watch. You know, this allows to put the hands of the creatives back into the creators who make it. The money is not trickling down back into the people that are making it. Uh, so when we pitched this out, we had a lot of interest from some very, very uh, notable films and sales agents and streamers all having interest in the story once we had the exclusive with John, but they weren't given the money where, where it was really allowed us to do the story we wanted to tell. Interestingly, when uh, the event happened with um, former President Trump at the assassination attempt there, a lot of people that said, oh, it wasn't a very strong story, all flooded with emails of we're interested. So I think it was very important to release it on this platform and putting the creative and the hands back into, you know, our production company that, that made it. John received a total of $1 for this film just as a legal requirement to, to do it. So he's telling his story in true honesty and I had to sort of respect that. He doesn't get any points from it, but uh, us as the creatives that tell authentic stories uh, and the, the digital economy is changing the landscape of how people are streaming, how people are consuming content. YouTube is now becoming one of the biggest uh, in, indirect streaming services now, people are consuming through TikTok. So we thought, let's do it on our own platform, do it ourselves, let's receive all the profits for it, and let's make the story that authentically needs to be told the way it needs to be told. Uh, so, yeah, Hinkley.movie is the way to see it on August 30. Uh, and you can pre-order it now or it'll be available uh, next week. Fantastic. Neil McGregor, it's been a great pleasure ch chatting with you about Hinkley. I shot the president from Glass Engine, hinkley.movie. Remember, Hinkley is spelled H-I-N-C-K-L-E-Y. Congratulations on a fantastic documentary. I still can't believe you were able to whittle this down to an hour and a half. So uh, that that's impressive in and of itself. And hopefully next time you're in L.A., we get to hang out with each other a bit. Looking forward to it. We'll be welcome anytime. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Robert.